Hello there, cinema lovers. Welcome to Filmstorm. If you haven't seen Kenneth Branagh's latest production, A Haunting in Venice, be warned, there will be spoilers. If you have watched it, and A, you liked it very much, B, you quite liked it, or C, you didn't like it at all, then our review will show you how much this production has to offer and how easy it is to miss all that. We invite you to a new episode of Filmstorm. You saw what I saw. For once in your life, admit that you are up against something bigger than you. Tonight, we are all afraid. We cannot hide from our ghosts. Whether they are real or not. As the title suggests, in this production, each of the characters is haunted by something. Characters who are generally much better written and played than in Murder on the Orient Express or Death on the Nile. I think that's debatable, but okay. The characters are haunted by a feeling of guilt connected to someone's death, a lost love, professional burnout, war trauma, a fear of having one's true identity revealed, the toil of trying to make ends meet, and finally, ghosts. What is more, the film wants us, the viewers, to be haunted too. Maybe not entirely by the desire to solve the mystery, because that's Poirot's job, and we usually like to be surprised in this matter, but by the desire to follow everything that is happening around the main mystery. That is, to explore the location that the characters are confined to, all the props and set design, the backstories, and the way the story unfolds. If we are careful enough and manage to connect all the dots, after all the plot twists, we begin to see a haunting in Venice from a much more interesting perspective. Let's start with the location that narrows down from the general to the specific. We see amazing shots of Venice from a bird's eye view. Then we enter the noisy Venetian canals and bridges, and finally we enter the haunted palazzo, a place so original and dark that Guillermo del Toro himself would probably like to take it on. As our perspective narrows, the main clue in the investigation appears. That is the apple. A symbol of temptation, deception, but also, to use biblical context, a way out of a safe place. We can see apples almost everywhere, because they are related to Halloween celebrations in Great Britain, especially the game of apple bobbing, that is, catching apples with your teeth uh, from a bowl filled with water. This tradition, depicted in the film, is also a kind of reference to the literary prototype of a haunting in Venice, that is, Agatha Christie's Halloween party. The action of the novel takes place in England during All Hallows' Eve, when a girl, who claims to have been witness to a crime, is later drowned in the mentioned bowl with water and apples. This death is referenced in the film in a scene where Poirot is almost drowned in similar circumstances. However, these are by no means all the apples we can see in a haunting in Venice. The apple that Poirot receives at the beginning of the film is a temptation to leave his safe haven of retirement and focus on the narrower perspective of the murder. Moreover, he receives it from a temptress, a friend who turns out to have ulterior motives. Although we might not notice it at the start, once we are locked in the palazzo, beautiful in its dark atmosphere, we see and hear an old clock striking the hours. Every hour we witness two figurines emerging from the clock, Adam and Eve carrying him an apple, while between them a deceptive snake coils itself around the trunk of the Tree of Knowledge. The temptation of Poirot and the temptation of Adam. And so the broad perspective of Poirot and his friend, the writer, is narrowed here and shown as a miniature on a clock that seems to tell us, the viewers, to also narrow our perspective and focus on the details. While the apple from Eve, like that from a false friend, is a symbol of temptation, betrayal and of leaving of safe place, all of which Poirot experiences, it also means something else. 
the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil is not so much the fruit of knowledge, but of control over good and evil. The Hebrew word yada, usually translated as knowledge, has a much broader meaning and can be understood as not only to know something, but also to master something, to control something. Thus, the text of the book of Genesis does not tell us that Adam and Eve knew good and evil, but that they mastered it, uh, wanting to decide for themselves what was right and what was not. By accepting the apple, leaving his garden and his safe space, Poirot breaks away from inaction. He has to take control of the situation in the palazzo that seems to slip out of his hands, and then he re-evaluates his life, wondering whether he is really doing the right thing and whether he is in the right place, surrounded by the right people. And finally, he takes back control of his life. There is one last apple, which we will return to at the end of this material, for the grand finale. Meanwhile, as you know, you can usually deduce much more from a film adaptation when you know the original book and the author's profile. As most Agatha Christie's fans probably know, before she was hailed as a master of crime stories, she worked as a pharmacist and she knew a lot about drugs, including poisons. And she used uh, that knowledge in a lot of her books. She also knew a lot of them thanks to numerous journeys with her husband, an archaeologist and researcher of, among other things, ancient Egypt, hence a direct inspiration to write Death on the Nile, a book previously adapted by Kenneth Branagh. Knowing Agatha Christie's backstory and her novels, we can expect poison to be one of the murder weapons. Therefore, when in A Haunting in Venice, one of the characters suddenly finds a jar of honey uh, another one shows us around a garden full of flowers of one type, pollinated by bees, and then another one, while disinfecting a wound with the above-mentioned honey, notices its peculiar taste, we know that something's afoot. Here we are slowly approaching the grand finale, but where are the ghosts? Well, ghosts present a great mystery from the very beginning. Just like the ubiquitous apples, we also see the letter M several times. Whether supernatural or not, no one, including Poirot, seems to be able to decipher it. Moreover, even though it is not made clear until the end of the film, the letter M simply means mother. So the last apple, which we mentioned, is the apple in the English phrase the apple of someone's eye, a reference to an overprotective mother who incapacitated her own daughter, Alicia. As for the honey, in one of the scenes, Poirot finds himself in a partially flooded basement and discovers a skeleton in the water, which then disintegrates and a swarm of bees comes out of its mouth. This is a clear reference to the body of the dead girl found floating in the canal and the way poison was applied. Alicia was given the poisoned honey in her tea. What surprised me the most is the involvement of an extremely developed boy in the whole scheme. The boy who is both the guardian of his father, suffering from war trauma, and the mastermind or puppet master pulling too many strings, surprisingly, for noble reasons. Yes, Jamie Dornan and Jude Hill once again did a great job as father and son after Belfast, a film also by Branagh. The role of the boy reminded me of an adult in a child's body from the classic anime Cowboy Bebop. However, that boy was ruthless and calculating, while the boy from A Haunting in Venice is both smart and superior to many characters, as well as empathetic and caring, which makes him an even more interesting character. Furthermore, if someone prefers to believe in the ghost story and Branagh left such a loophole, uh, they can observe an interesting friendship between the boy and the vengeful ghosts, who supposedly lead to the death of every doctor or nurse. While the medium, who used to be a, uh, a nurse, dies relatively quickly, the boy's father, who is a doctor, stays in the haunted palazzo for a long time without any harm to his health, which allows us to think that the extremely intelligent boy, who for some reason always knows more than the others, has some kind of deal with the ghosts and protects his father from both humans and the vengeance of the dead children in the palazzo. 
Unfortunately, in the end, being overprotective doesn't do anyone any good. An overprotective mother leads to the death of her daughter, an overprotective son causes his father to become a target and gets him killed, and Poirot himself allows others to take care of his safety and almost pays for it with his own life. So in the, in the end, it is best to take the most important things into your own hands. And so we invite you to take things in your hand and follow us on Facebook, on Instagram, subscribe to our channel or leave a comment below the video. And may no film storm ever scare you. Bye. Bye.